Dangerous Assignment, transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to wind up with my life being saved by a handful of cigars. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, you're going ghost hunting. Ever hear of Eli Bryant? Eli Bryant? Sounds familiar. World War II, an American trader, collaborated with the Japanese in the South Pacific. Oh, yeah, finger man, first class. He was killed in 1944 during one of our raids, wasn't he? So we thought. Eli Bryant is still very much alive, Steve. Been in hiding ever since. According to our information, he's in Australia. Had a plastic surgery job done on his face. One of our boys get a line on him? No, a man named Walt Cooper claimed he recognized Bryant in Darwin two weeks ago. He contacted us and said we'd hear from him again. What's his angle? It looks like he's trying to make some sort of deal. Putting the squeeze on Eli Bryant, and if that doesn't work, he's going to try to see how much he can get from us. That looks like it. Well, have we heard from him again? I've just heard about him. Cooper's body was found in a ditch on the outskirts of Darwin three nights ago. Huh. Looks like he tried to pull the blackmail bite on the wrong man. And Steve, get over there. Find the man who killed Cooper, and I think you'll find Eli Bryant. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Get my assignment, fly to Darwin, Australia, track down the killer of a would-be blackmailer, and I'll probably wind up with a gent named Eli Bryant, American traitor, fingerman for the Japanese in World War II. It's late Tuesday afternoon when my plane lands at Darwin, and half an hour later I'm at police headquarters talking about Cooper's murder with the officer in charge. He brings out a flock of photographs and x-rays. You see what I mean, Mr. Mitchell? Here. Yeah. Wound on the back of Cooper's skull is rather unusual. No ordinary weapon, that's for sure. Looks as if he was struck with a club of some sort. Yeah, and one with spikes in it at that. Right. What have you found out about him? Cooper? Oh, very little. Single, lived in a boarding house, had very few friends. One of them was a man named Fleming. John Fleming lived at the same address. You have Fleming in for a talk? Fleming's here all right, in the morgue. He's dead. What? The farmer found Fleming's body in a parked car this morning, some 50 miles south of here. Don't tell me he was hit with that spike club. No, a 45 caliber bullet finished him off. That killer of ours seems to be having a busy week. No, this wasn't the same person, I'm sure. Oh? You see, Fleming's death wasn't a deliberate killing, Mr. Mitchell. One of my men telephoned in two hours ago with the news that a young lady reported someone had broken into a farmhouse near Murchison Creek last night. She fired a few shots at the man, thought she missed. It was Fleming? Yes, somehow he must have managed to get back to his car, drive a mile or so. And then conked out, huh? Conk? Oh, uh, (laughs) yes, of course. Excuse me, Mr. Mitchell. Yes? Mr. Pelling, eh? Just a moment. Fleming's employer. I asked him to drop in. Want to talk to him? Sure. All right, have Mr. Pelling come in. Pelling runs some sort of a curio shop. Fleming was one of his clerks. I see. Come in, Mr. Pellin. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Pellin. How do you do, Mr. Pellin? Sit down, sir. I can't tell you what a shock Fleming's death has been to me, gentlemen. Why, he's been with me for years. My best clerk. You knew him pretty well, then? Of course. That is, I thought I did. What do you mean? Well, he was quiet, dependable, devoted to the store. I was thinking about bringing him in the firm as a partner. And the other day... Well, he quit. Just like that. I couldn't understand it. Mr. Pellin, have you ever met a man called Cooper? Cooper? Cooper. Let me think. A friend of Fleming's. He might have been in your store a few times. No. No, I I don't believe I ever met the man. Well, looks like my next stop is that farmhouse near Murchison Crick. 
and the young lady who plugged Fleming. I'll check with you later, Lieutenant. It's raining hard when my train pulls out of Darwin and raining even harder when I arrive at Murchison Creek Station three hours later. It's really out in the middle of nowhere, nothing but rolling plains. I finally get directions to the farmhouse I'm looking for. It's a one-mile walk in the rain. Yes? What do you want? You, uh, Augusta Wells? That's right. My name's Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. Here's my credentials. Hmm, big-time policeman. Yeah. Now, how about putting away that forty-five? What? Oh, sorry. Come on in. I'm still a little nervous after what happened last night. Nice place you have here. Run it alone? My father and I do. Pops away on a trip to Melbourne. Business? Yes. We raise pigs. Uh, I know. South wind again, hmm? You're American, aren't you, Miss Wells? Yes, but make it Gussie. Please never call me Augusta. I was born in a town of the same name. A whim of my parents. I have a brother who was born in Toledo. Aren't I lucky? What were you asking me? Uh, last night, about... Uh... Oh, well, there isn't much to say. I heard a noise in the den and came in to investigate. There he was, going out the window. He didn't stop when you called out? No, so I let it fly. Didn't know I'd hit him till this morning. One of the farmers down the road told me. Do you have any idea what the man wanted in the den? No, nothing much of value there. Mind if I have a look? No. Come ahead. Here we are. I saw him as I opened the door. He was over there by the window. Uh-huh, and what did... Well, what is it, Mr. Mitchell? What's wrong? The thing I expect to see in an Australian farmhouse is a wooden cigar store Indian, but there he is, about five feet tall. Then I spot something else resting by the Indian's foot and carved into the base of the figure is a war club, a wicked-looking weapon with half a dozen spikes sticking out of it. What's, what's wrong, Mr. Mitchell? I've suddenly become interested in this. That war club? Mm. It doesn't come loose. It's sort of a permanent fixture, carved right out of the pedestal. So I see. How long has the chief been in the family? Only since yesterday afternoon. Oh? Gift from a friend of mine, Bertie Slack. He's got a weird sense of humor and a face to match. Last year, he sent me a moose head for my birthday. Where's uh, Bertie get this, do you know? In Darwin, a store called Pellins. Pellins? Curio shop of some sort. Bertie's a regular customer. I see. When did he buy it? A couple of days ago. Why? The man who broke into your den last night, Fleming, was a clerk at Pellins. Oh? Yeah. And a friend of his named Cooper was murdered four nights ago with a weapon that could be this war club. But how? That club is part of the pedestal. You can't swing the whole work. No, but a man could fall, hit his head against the pedestal. Oh, sure. Sure, I guess so. You have a phone? We're not that civilized. Uh, look, do you mind if I borrow your redskin friend? I think the police in Darwin might be interested in him and maybe in Mr. Pellin, too. You mean you want to take the Indian back with you? Why not? Well, you'll have to wait until morning. There isn't another train till then. Oh? I have a spare bedroom. Yeah, I noticed. And a gun. I noticed that, too. If you'll help me with the linen and blankets. Sure. Lead the way, Gussie. Bed's made. There's an extra blanket in the cupboard if you need it. Okay, thanks. Hey, wait a minute. Listen. Sounds like a truck pulling away. Funny I didn't hear it approach. Could have posted in. Well, what would a truck be doing around here this time of That's night? That's what I want to find out. Hall lights right at the bottom of the stairs. Okay. I want to take a look in the den here. Hey. The Indian. It's gone. <laughs> In just a moment, Steve Mitchell will continue his Dangerous Assignment. And now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Gussie wheels a small car out of the garage and we take off after the truck. The road is wet from the recent rain, but we slowly gain. Then we come to a steep grade. Gussie comes up alongside the truck, but it suddenly swerves over, trying to crowd us off the road. Gussie hits the brakes. The truck misses us and goes into a skid over the bank. We stop, get out, and climb down to the wreck. 
How many are there? There's only the driver, and he's dead. Yeah, here's the chief, safe and sound in the back. What are we going to do now? How far is it to Darwin? About 70 miles. Through country like this? Most of the way. Real rugged, isn't it? Yeah, see, I'd feel a lot better if I got the chief there as soon as possible. Do you think you could drive us? Well, it's going to be a little crowded in this car, but after all, I don't often get a chance to take one man for a ride, let alone two. Come on. How far have we come? About halfway. Oh, fine. Getting tired? Well, holding this wooden warrior in my lap is not exactly my idea of comfort. Steve. What's the matter? That bend in the road behind us, some headlights just came round it. Yeah. Hey, gaining on us, too. Coming up pretty fast. You think he's after us? That answer your question? It sure does. Step on it. Screech around a curve and then spot a clump of trees and pull in behind it. Their car roars past. Then... Hey. Yeah. The tracks run parallel to the road, about half a mile away. I thought you said there was no train until morning. I meant passenger trains. They run a slow freight and cattle train through every night. I'd settle for that right now, believe me, but I don't suppose I've got a chance of catching it. Sure we have. Huh? There's a grade right over there. It slows almost to a stop. Okay, let's start hiking. Hurry, Steve. Just a little faster and we'll make it. This baby weighs a ton. Here, I'll try and get it on this flat car. There. Come on, climb aboard. I sure didn't realize what I was getting into when my friend Bertie sent this chief to me. I'm still a little hazy about some of the details. I think it breaks down something like this. Helen, the owner of the curio shop where the Indian came from, is actually Eli Bryant, a war trader and collaborator we've been chasing for several years. I heard his name mentioned during the war. Yeah, a guy named Cooper found out who Cullen was and tried to blackmail him. In a fight, Cooper got shoved over, hit his head on the chief's club, and it killed him. Cullen carted his body away, but the Indian here is proof of where the murder took place and puts the finger on Cullen. But this Fleming who tried to break into my house. Yeah, he was a clerk at Cullen's. He probably tried to pick up the blackmail gag where his friend Cooper had left off. He could have sold the Indian to your friend Bertie so it would be in a safe place, and he could put the pressure on Cullen. Well, I guess that explains everything. Hey, they seem to be stopping. What's that up there ahead? Cattle shoes. Probably going to unload. Wait a minute. The car parked up near the front of the train. Yeah, the tracks curve around and cross the road. That's the car that was chasing us. They must have figured the switch and backtrack. Come on, we're getting off on the other side here. Well, how about the chief? He's coming with us. There. Hey, look, the ditch beside the roadbed. Steve, this isn't going to work. You can't get very far carrying the chief. You got any better ideas? Yeah, I think I've got my bearings now. This section of the country looks familiar. Could you hide here for a little while with the chief? Yeah, I guess so. We're out of sight here. Why? What's your idea? See you later. As it takes off across the fields, I don't know what her idea is, but I hope it works. All I can do is stay under cover in the ditch with the wooden Indian. Twenty minutes later, I hear a sound. A motor of some type, but I can't peg it. It gets closer, and then all of a sudden, Gussie comes wheeling up to the edge of the ditch. What? A motorcycle. Sure, complete with sidecar for you and the chief. Oh, no. Where did you get it? Some people I know live a couple of miles away. I borrowed it from them. Did you telephone the Darwin police? No, they don't have a phone there. Oh, fine. So we hit the road again. Well, not exactly. What do you mean? Might be safer to travel cross country away before cutting back to the road. Yeah, I guess you're right. Okay, chief, let's saddle up. probably get back on the road now. Oh, man, I couldn't possibly think of a better idea. There. Yeah. I don't see any sign of a car behind us. We may have shaken them. Getting light. Yeah. Hey, don't tell me. 
Hmm? Civilization. Look, up there beside the road, a farmhouse. And telephone wires leading to it. Well, what do you know? I'll head in behind the back porch there. Fine. There. Out of sight of the road now. Yeah. Come on, Chief. We're dismounting. See? Looks pretty deserted around here. Yeah. Smells musty. Probably been shut up for some time. There's a phone. Dead? Dead. What do we do now? That's a good question. Steve, the front door. I'll take a peek out the window. Is it Helen? No, I've never seen this guy before. Come here, take a look. Recognize him? No, I've never seen him either. He could be working for Pelham. Who is it? Name's Bedwell. I need a bit of a helping hand. Oh? What do you mean? My automobile is stalled on the road. I'm not much of a hand at tinkering. I thought you might be able to help me. Steve, it could be a trap. Yeah, I know, but if it isn't, if he's legit, we can fix his car. It's our best way of getting to Darwin. I say, I'm still here. Here, take the gun, Gussie, and keep me covered all the way. Don't show yourself. All right, but be careful. Well, good morning. Hi. Where is this car of yours? Oh, see? It's through that clump of trees. Oh, yeah. I've been sitting it out most of the night and didn't want to disturb you until it got light. Okay, let's take a look. I walk to the car with Bedwell, still wondering if it's a trap, but nothing happens. We get to the car, I find the loose distributor wire and fix it. Bedwell gets in and the car starts like a top. I say... I guess that was it, all right. Well, thanks awfully, old boy. Sure. Are you heading toward Darwin? Yes. Can I give you a lift? You sure can. Hop in. Well, there are some others back in the house that have to go, too. Oh, others? Oh, who are they? One's a girl. Oh, how jolly. Does she have a friend? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, yes. Who's the friend? Well, you may find this a little hard to believe, Mr. Bedwell, but you see... The friend is a wooden Indian. What? Helen. A gun? I say, what is all this popping out from behind trees with talk of wooden Indians? Get out of the car, quickly. What happened to the accent, Felon? I don't need it anymore. Well, really? Now, Mr. Mitchell. You finally caught up with us. I certainly did. You see, I found out whom Fleming had sold the Indian to and sent one of my men after it. The guy in the truck? Yes. Fortunately, I followed along myself in my car. It's been a long chase, but it's over now. I say, I really don't know what any of this is all about, but I'm sure it's none of my business. And if you'll excuse me... Harley, you were unfortunate enough to happen along at the wrong time. That Indian proves Cooper was killed at your curio shop. Cooper knew who Eli Bryant was, the collaborator we've been chasing all these years. That sort of makes you Bryant. Exactly. Now we're all going back to the farmhouse and our friend, the wooden Indian. <laughs> start back to the farmhouse. I know Gussie's covering me, but when we get to the door, I realize it's not going to do me any good. Pellin is too smart. He jams his gun against my backbone and yells through the door. Open up, young lady. And if you have a gun, drop it. Either that or I shoot Mr. Mitchell. Gussie opens up, drops her gun. Pellin spots the wooden Indian, and I know I've got to think fast because he's due to start shooting any second. Then I get an idea. The wooden Indian is standing beside the table on which the phone sits. Well, now that I have the Indian... It's too late, Helen. The police already know about you. I telephoned them a few minutes ago. Ah, you're bluffing. This farmhouse is vacant. The phone's been disconnected. Don't kid yourself. Here, I'll show you. I pick up the phone and walk toward Helen. I manage to loop the wire over the Indian's outstretched hand, the one that holds the wooden cigars. Helen takes the phone just as he starts to listen. I give the wire a jerk and pulls the Indian forward into Helen's gun. Uh, Too late. All right, Steve? Sure. Our friend the chief here saved us. Now, if Mr. Bedwell will be kind enough to take us all to Darwin... A a wooden Indian for a friend? A deserted farmhouse. Oh, really, I... We're not really nuts, Mr. Bedwell. I can explain. Oh, quiet, quiet. Hey, Bedwell, come back. Bedwell! Gussie. Yeah? You better crank up your little motorcycle again.
Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Don Levy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe. John Storm speaking. <laughs> Included in tonight's cast were Kay Stewart, Dan O'Herlihy, Don Morrison, and Ben Wright. Be with us again next week at the same time when Brian Don Levy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.